thank you, uh, Moth and Cookie. I'll just take this right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't want to time. Oh, <laughs> I'll give you a pass. <laughs> Thanks, Moth. And now, for the opposition side speech, opposing the motion, this House believes the United States needs a president with those strings attached, I give you Hugo Hackenbush! Thank you for that kind introduction, Commissioner Gordon. And uh, I want to tell you how happy I am to be here at this park, this lovely city, and to be talking to people who are supporters of and participants in debate. I think it takes a lot to be a debater. Well, you got to have at least three things. You've got to have a laptop, an attitude, and your virginity. This <laughs> <laughs> crowd may be a little older, but I think you're probably clicking on all the cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to welcome our, our British friends here, uh, Mod and Hoople. And uh, I, I'm sorry, Cookie and Hoople. Uh, well, let me, let me begin by saying that um, I have a feeling of affinity for these two guys. I have an honorary PhD from the University of Durham, along with several other British universities, including Cambridge, Edinburgh. Edinburgh, yes. Also, I have a pair of Oxfords. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, folks, I'm not entirely fluent in British, and so I brought Professor Line along to help with any translation difficulties. He's already told me that lift means elevator. That's a good thing he told me because I was going to ask one of these guys for a lift after the debate. You can imagine the confusion. It could have been worse. I could have asked to see the trunk of their car and they could have given me the boot. But anyway, I want to talk about strings. And uh, I think it's interesting to see that my two opponents are stringless entities. And it's a bit disconcerting to look up and see two faces there. The last time that happened to me, I was debating Mitt Romney. <laughs> <laughs> so you see now, uh, you may not see strings in my case because I am a ventriloquist duck. I'm a ventriloquist duck. I can't say it. A ventriloquist companion. <laughs> and we don't have external strings, but we have internal strings. So for example, there are strings moving my mouth, as I'm sure many of you have. And uh, the more expensive model had strings moving the eyebrows and the, uh, and the hair, but Professor Lyle was too cheap to go for that. <laughs> At any rate, I don't look down on those who don't have strings, but I think that if we're talking about leadership, we should have someone with strings attached. And I've got four main contentions here. The first has to do with the fundamental nature of reality. <laughs> if you listen to the the uh, most uh, prominent theoretical physicist, they'll tell you the ultimate constituents of reality are strings. That's right. <laughs> Very tiny, vibrating strings. And I'm talking tiny. Tinier than the honorarium they're giving me. <laughs> now, if you want a leader who's grounded in reality, or the point of phrase, the reality community, the reality-based community, then you want somebody who's attached to strings, and strings are attached to them. Now, there's an old adage you may have heard. Show me a man without strings, and I'll show you a man on his way to invading a rock. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings to my second point. My second point is that strings are good because they are constraints on us. Necessary constraints. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the ties that bind to community, to memory, to history, to constitutions. How many of you here remember the Constitution? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Oh, that's very sad. I'll have to bring in Mr. Gonzalez for an update. <laughs> but uh, this perhaps illustrates my point. You have to have constraints of all of these. Now, take our current president, please. <laughs> Here's a man who apparently has no strings attached, not to the Constitution, not to history, not to Congress, not to rationality, as far as I can tell. And is this a problem? I think it is. We have in this case a man who is simply a decider. <laughs> a free-floating decider. Now this bothers me, and I think it should bother you too. Because this means that he uh, has no connections to restrain him. And I gotta say, I gotta admit, I'm something of a Burkean, an Edmund Burkean, when it comes to uh, political philosophy. Uh, not a revolutionary. Because I think uh, we're really dealing with some radicals in the White House. This brings me to my third point, and that is, 
I think we know in our hearts and in our cultures, notice how I covered both places there, in our hearts and in our culture, that the attachments of strings are right and necessary. Now, what do I mean by this? Some of you read the philosopher René Descartes. Some of you read him. He separated mind from body. And after he did that, he started having sleepless nights. He started becoming paranoid that perhaps because the mind was separate and unencumbered by the physical world, it might just take on a life of its own and fill itself with illusion, fantasy, fictions. That it in fact could be, a, that mentality could be a projection by an evil genie like uh, Dick Cheney or something sir, like that. Sir. Yes, yes. Well, I have no body, but yet we it's see people in this argument. How does that work? Oh, I think you're pretty mature of that. <laughs> Talk about detachment. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have scripted that better. <laughs> so anyway, um, he worried about this idea of being detached, and that's a, that's an anxiety that runs deep through our culture. How many of you have seen the movie The Matrix? Seen The Matrix? Yeah, that's great. I wrote this screenplay for that movie. <laughs> and I think it represents some of the same anxiety, the fear that maybe all that we experience is reality is just a kind of projection into our mind. Now that's what you have when you have an idea wall. He's not governed by any material reality or any tradition or any constitutional tradition. He's governed only by the ideology project, projected in his mind, perhaps by an evil genie like you too. But that brings me to my... That brings me to my... Um, sir! Sir! Wait a minute, what do you think? What did I say so far? I had uh, that strength of the ultimate constitution for reality. Get along with me. The what? second was that uh, strings are necessary constraints. Two. And that's as far as I can, right? No, 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 that we know in our hearts and minds that strings are right. Hey. All right. Well, then there's a four. And I'm trying to remember just now. Hang on, just a second. Oh, that, that in terms of political philosophy, strings are the right thing. Now, I know there's some of you debate types who are weekend Nietzscheans. <laughs> <laughs> and you like to go out and cut all the strings and subordinate everything to the will. And I say that's not a good idea. And in fact, I think it's true in the White House are a bunch of closet Nietzscheans. That's what I think. <laughs> Subordinate everything to the will. Some of you are probably Habermasians and you believe in this ideal speech situation. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not the real world either. It's not even, and I'll put your seatbelts for this one, it's not even an ideal ideal world. Why? Because it's detached from the very material conditions of reality, and this creates dangerous illusions. So, those are my four points, and I won't make you count with me again. So, at this point, I will appeal to our, our friends. Oh, I meant, and, uh, what was I? Oh, yes, yes. And so let the debate continue and let the French fries fall where they may. Translation checks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.